Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Allison Leopold, and I will be moderating today's event. I am a proud Wash U parent. My daughter, Olivia, is a senior psychology major in the School of Arts and Sciences. And my son, James, is currently on a gap year, but will be starting in the business school next fall. I'm excited to welcome fellow parents, alumni, staff, and friends of Wash U to tonight's chocolate tasting. What an amazing way to kick off the holidays. Our audience is diverse and participants are viewing from 19 states tonight. For those of you who are parents, we hope your students enjoyed a successful fall semester. Welcome to all of you. I'd like to quickly review our format. We have a large audience of almost 200 people with us tonight, so you will only hear and see me and our two experts from Guitar Chocolate. We hope you will find this event to be enjoyable and informative. We encourage you to participate by engaging in chat and asking questions at any time. To ask a question, type in the Q&A box. We will do our best to address as many questions as possible throughout the event and at the end of the presentation and tasting. It is now my pleasure to introduce WashU parent and plant manager of Guitar Chocolate, Tim Grace, and director of marketing of Guitar Chocolate, Amy Guitard. Tim and his wife, Jennifer Guitard, are proud parents to a current WashU student, Jack. Tim has worked for Guitar Chocolate for four and a half years, and Amy has worked in the longstanding family business for nine years. They are with us today to walk us through how chocolate is made, Guitard's history, and how to best taste origin chocolate. Please join me in welcoming Tim and Amy. Mute us. Do you want to? Yeah. Hey, everybody. Um, so uh, this is my first experience doing this kind of a presentation, <laughs> by the way. Normally it's in person. So. Um, Hopefully this will go smooth and well. Um, just a quick note, Amy and I are going to uh, switch off with our masks. Um, when one's talking, as I am now, the other one will be wearing their mask. Um, our plant has been, uh, we have two plants actually, uh, and about 170 people in each in uh, total. And our plants have both been open this whole time during uh, COVID pandemic. Um, we've taken uh, extraordinary measures. And to be honest with you, we're very, very proud of all of our people. Um, we've kept uh, almost nobody has, has been in, infected. So we've had uh, one person so far in this whole time. Um, so we, we've taken COVID very, very seriously and uh, are gonna continue to do that during this presentation. Uh, <laughs> we, it's uh, keeping our people safe has uh, really been kind of number one priority over the past many months. So uh, with that, uh, um, so we're gonna go ahead and we'll start. share a screen here. Um, so hopefully everyone can, can see the screen. Um, as Tim said, uh, we're going to walk through um, the presentation and uh, there'll be some, some time at the end to answer any questions. But um, as mentioned early on, please submit them in the Q&A um, and feel free to engage in, in the chat. Um, once we get to the tasting, we'll be encouraging everyone to share their thoughts in the chat. So um, if you're unfamiliar with that, feel free to play around with it as I'm giving the talk. Um, and so we can get started. So a little bit about uh, Guitard. Um, I'm gonna spend some time just talking a little bit about the history of Guitard to give everyone an overview. Um, some of the chocolates that we're gonna get into at the end of the presentation for the actual tasting uh, reference the history of the company. So um, I wanted to kind of take a step back and give a little bit of an overview of, of who we are and um, why we do what we do. Um, I love showing this slide because it kind of gives a little bit of a visual representation of the history and the evolution of Guitard. And we have a fair amount of logos that we've adopted um, over time. None of our current logos are actually represented in this slide, but it's still a fun one. Um, and it kind of shows, again, the evolution um, and how we've uh, evolved as a company um, over time. 
A lot of people aren't aware that about 80% um, or more of our business is actually selling chocolate in as an ingredient to a lot of wholesale customers. Um, and so the products that you have today, two of them are just for chefs and confectioners. Those are our single origins. Um, and the bar is actually a consumer product. Um, but we also sell a lot of baking chocolate as well. Um, to uh, consumers on that side of the business. But we started off um, in 1868 selling chocolate um, as a provision, and I'll get into some details there, um, getting ahead of myself a little bit. Um, this is a photograph of my cousin Clark, myself, and my dad, and this was taken uh, several years ago, so a bit ago. Um, just imagine Tim's body <laughs> right there next to my dad. Um, Clark, and Clark is my brother. Yeah. <laughs> Clark's his brother-in-law, um, but we are a family business. Um, Clark and I represent and Tim represent the fifth generation um, and my dad Gary is the the fourth um, and so we're over 150 years um, and throughout our 150 year history we really have always committed ourselves to delivering products with an extreme degree of quality um, and sustainability. I always talk about the fact that my grandfather went to origin sort of before it was cool one could say um, and he was traveling to West Africa and meeting with buyers um, way back in the day so it really it really is something that um, we believe in and, and really makes us who we are as a company. Um, so again, taking a little bit of a step back and talking about our history, that's my great great grandfather Etienne, um, who traveled to San Francisco in search of gold in the 1850s. His uncle had a chocolate factory in France and he had brought chocolate with him to trade for mining supplies. And when he got to San Francisco, he realized that a lot of the merchants were the ones that were um, making a bit more money than those who were mining for gold. So he went back to France and learned the skill of making chocolate from his uncle and returned to San Francisco in 1868. And at that point in time, he opened doors um, at our first factory, which was in, on Sansom Street. And for those of you who are familiar with San Francisco, um, Sansom runs right near the Embarcadero. So you can imagine as beans and other commodities were being brought to the ports of San Francisco, it was a really convenient location to be um, setting up a factory to receive those beans and efficiently start crafting chocolate. Um, so this is an old poster that sort of harkens back to that that era and um, you can see our address listed there at the bottom and um, as you can imagine chocolate is which will Tim's going to get into a little bit later chocolate is a grinding business so um, you source the beans and you do over a series of um, steps you basically are taking those beans and grinding them into finer and finer particles so back um, in the late 1800s um, you couldn't make money just mining for gold or uh, mining for gold. You couldn't do that either. Um, you couldn't make money um, just making one commodity like chocolate. So um, we diversified our product portfolio and made things other than just um, just chocolate. Um, this is a photograph of some of the other commodity companies that were located right along the Embarcadero along with us. Um, Folgers Coffee, Hills Brothers Coffee, MJB, um, Guitard, ourselves, uh, Ghirardelli, and then Hills Brothers Coffee is over there on the on the bottom right. That's their old building. And again, as you can imagine, there's stories of back in the day along the Embarcadero getting wafts of coffee being roasted and chocolate roasting, um, cocoa beans roasting. And so it really was a very tight-knit community of um, merchants and uh, those that were processing uh, commodities like coffee and and chocolate and so it was a really rich um, community that was that was being built in in San Francisco back then um, this is a photograph of uh, a family unrelated to us but um, it's a fun photograph because it just again kind of shows the heritage of guitar and our presence in the city that um, poster there on the side of the building you can't quite see the image on the top but it says when the sun comes up guitar comes down um, and that is supposed to allude to our first product that we made which was a drinking chocolate which a lot of uh, folks would consume as a beverage for breakfast back then so the idea was as the sun comes up uh, for the morning you pull guitar down from your shelf and enjoy it as a breakfast treat so um, again sort of a, a little bit of a step back in time to see the presence of guitar popping up um, around San Francisco 
Um, this is an, another old poster. Again, this is alluding to how we had diversified our product por portfolio back then. Um, you can see coffees, teas, and spices from the guitar manufacturing company. So again, it wasn't just chocolate that we were making because you needed to diversify your offerings. And in, in, in addition to that, we were also grinding coffees, teas, and spices um, as all of those commodities require grinding as well. Um, if you want to make money and suit your trade is what the tagline was. Um, I love reading these these old advertisements because they really are a little bit of a step back in time um, and you can sort of see once you place all of them next to each other our, our um, front office has a bunch of old uh, advertisements in the front from like the 50s and they all sort of carry a very sort of tongue-in-cheek similar um, tone to them and it's kind of fun to see the evolution. Um, this is a, another old photograph um, again just showing Guitard um, on Clay and Davis streets in, in old San Francisco. Um, back in 1906, there was the big earthquake and fire of San Francisco and that burned about half of the city down along with our first factory on Sansom Street. And so along with the help of some of those other companies that I had mentioned earlier, we were able to rebuild our second factory. We, we were temporarily um, on Commercial Street and then we relocated to Main Street. Um, and that was where our second factory was. Um, and after Main Street, ironically, or maybe not ironically, the city uh, decided to build the central freeway, which went directly over our factory. So eminent domain uh, pushed us out of San Francisco in the early 50s. And my grandfather, Horace, uh, purchased land um, with the money from, from the city kicking us out um, at, down in Burlingame, which is where we are located right now, um, which, which is where our main factory is. As Tim mentioned earlier, we also have a second facility up in Fairfield, which again, if you're uh, not familiar with the Bay Area, it's about uh, 45 five, depending traffic, uh, minutes north of San Francisco. Um, so we've got two factories. Our main facility in terms of processing and production is here in Burlingame. Um, so as you can see from this sort of bird's eye photograph, uh, there's a lot of farmland around there. So not a lot um, going on now. It's There's a tremendous amount of development um, and we are one of the oldest buildings um, still, still around in, in this neighborhood. Um, this is a photograph of my grandfather. He's the striking gentleman in the dark tie hold, holding the, um, the shovel. And uh, that's the whole crew who was there helping with the, with the groundbreaking. Um, and this is where we are today. Um, I love telling the little story about that funny looking um, Dutch girl. If you look, sometimes you can, you can see her, sometimes you can't, but it's the G for guitar. And my grandfather actually designed this logo. It was intended to represent Dutch products, which um, for all the bakers out there, you might remember or recognize the, the call in a lot of recipes for Dutch cocoa powder. That's a process that requires sodium bicarbonate. So you get um, a really uh, rich, uh, sort of Oreo cookie flavor note to your cocoa powders, but we created a logo or my, my grandfather, Popsy, created a logo to put on pack um, to indicate Dutch product. Um, you can see the, the Dutch woman with her, her hair um, and her neck is the uh, little saucer and cup um, and then her little feet and she's nice and rotund. Um, people started getting confused thinking that we are a Dutch company. So um, after making an appearance in our corporate logo for a few <laughs> years, maybe a decade. Um, we've since removed her, but as you can see, she's affectionately still um, has, a, has a place here at the company. Um, here's a little bit of a step back. Again, this is where Tim and I are located today um, and where our main facility is and um, where we've held this in-person presentation in years past. Um, again, this is just to take another step back because I like to do that and just gives a sense of some of our old packaging. Um, we were one of the first to introduce milk chocolate chips, um, which is what that uh, package on the bottom right is referencing. A lot of the the chocolate chip cookie packages from back in the day were uh, much smaller than they are today. So um, again, you can sort of get the sense of some of the um, iconography that was being used and some of the typography um, that we were employing in a lot of our packaging um, back then. And it's just kind of fun to see its evolution. Over 150 years, um, there's a fair amount of, of uh, different, different packaging, um, but a lot of it sort of, again, as I mentioned earlier, has kind of a very similar feel. Um, I'm going to get a little bit into sustainability, sort of um, high level, and I'm happy to answer questions later on, but 
I think it's important to have a sense of this as we start launching into more of the um, processing of cocoa and chocolate um, and give you a little bit of a sense of the importance of flavor and uh, social integrity, which is um, the main piece that happens sort of on the farm level. For us, we really believe that you can't make a premium end product without having strong investments on the, the ground and working with farmers. And so for us, flavor is a big driver for that. Everything that we do at the farm level is really driven around flavor and investing in flavor. So working in collaboration with farmers um, to teach them how to taste chocolate um, will oftentimes have farmers send us beans, we'll make little samples of chocolate and taste with them and have them get a sense of the proper fermentation and drying processes that will enable them to obtain sort of the premium flavor um, of, of the beans that we want to purchase from them. Uh, the photo in the top right there um, is a tasting that we did in Ghana. This is pretty common for us. We have a relationship with the Cocoa Research Institute of Ghana, Craig. Um, we also have relationships with um, a similar entity in Ivory Coast called the CCC, as well as in Indonesia, um, which is called ICRI. And we uh, work with these research institutes to train them on flavor so that they're teaching farmers the importance of flavor and also integrating it into their breeding programs so that they're not just breeding for high, uh, high yields and disease resistance, but they're also taking uh, flavor into account. And so this is a tasting that we are doing with a small farmer group. Um, you can't quite see it because it's upside down, but we have different samples of well-fermented beans, um, black pod, poorly fermented, under-fermented, over-fermented, um, which again are all really crucial steps to the flavor process um, and that farmers have full control over in terms of the work that they do at Origin. Um, here's just some photographs. Um, I'll spare you some of the stories because I know we're, we're, we don't have too much time. But um, again, John uh, Kehoe, our director of sustainability, who um, is in that photograph uh, in the bottom there, he and I travel to Origin on a regular basis, um, working with our on the ground partners and farmer groups um, on many of the initiatives that I just spoke to. Um, so I'm going to, again, spend a little bit of time giving some context of how chocolate starts to get made at origin um, and then hand it over to Tim, who's going to go into more details related to the actual production of it. So um, taking a step back and looking at where does cocoa grow. Um, so grow, cocoa grows 10 to 15 degrees either side of the equator. Um, here in that shaded region, that's affectionately known as the cocoa belt. Um, and so you can see sort of the northern and southernmost regions of where cocoa grows. Uh, for all intents and purposes, it's um, a relatively narrow strip. Uh, the majority of cocoa is grown sort of as close to the equator as, as um, possible. This is a photograph from Ecuador. Um, again, the real importance here about different origins is the diversity and celebrating that diversity. And single origins are a really beautiful way to experience that diversity, but it can also come to life in blends, which is um, what we're gonna talk to when we taste that uh, chocolate bar. But again, just getting a sense of the differences in how different origins process cocoa. Um, this is in Brazil uh, on a cocoa farm where they get around on donkeys. And this is me and my dad. This is an Ivory Coast. That was a while ago when he had a diff different glasses than he has now. Um, yeah, so this is an Ivory Coast. Um, there's a variety of different types of cacao. There's uh, sub varieties, but the main varieties are Trinitario, Criollo, and Forastero. Uh, different varieties grow in different regions. Um, and so you can start to see the difference in, in what they look like. So you can see that these um, are sort of, uh, for the most part, sort of. Um, uh, somewhat evenly uh, the shape of them is I would describe more footballish and um, this you start to have a little bit stronger grooves on the side a little bit longer um, the end is a little bit more pointed um, this again is uh, showing just the diversity of colors and pods that are out there and this is from one farm so you start to see the differences um, what happens is the cocoa is grown on a tree like this and you harvest the cacao um, and once you crack the pod open you have these white seeds inside and that white pulp is what is used to ferment the seeds and the fermentation is a really crucial component to developing flavor Different types of beans, as I had mentioned before, need to be fermented at different time frames. So Criollo, for instance, that's a white bean. You're gonna ferment that for a shorter period of time because it's more, it's a bit more delicate than say a Forastero, a Forastero, which is a little bit more of a heartier bean. So you're gonna wanna ferment that a little bit longer. Um, 
So again, farmers know quite well different levels, what, what beans they have and how it needs to be fermented. And um, there's always sort of optimization that can occur. And that's where our dialogue um, oftentimes happens with them. Again, this is in Ecuador, so you can start to see the different, the different types of pods and the different shapes of the seeds. Um, this is that's me in Ecuador. Um, that's my dad in Venezuela um, harvesting cacao. This is what the inside of it looks like. So you can start to see um, around uh, the gentleman's fingers, those, that's the pulp. So it's really slimy. Um, different varietals actually taste different once you, you can suck on the pulp um, and it's actually super yummy. Um, and different pods and varieties actually have very different tasting pulp. So um, it's really fun to be on a farm. For the most part, the farms might taste similar, um, but you do still get varieties in that. And I always liken it to apples, um, like a Brayburn versus a Granny Smith versus a Honey Crisp. They all taste very different um, and cocoa pods are, are not dissimilar to that. Um, this is uh, the, the fermentation process. So once the cacao seeds um, are pulled from the pod, they go into the fermentation stage. So in um, different countries, they ferment in different ways. Typically in West Africa, they do heap fermentation. So this is what these gentlemen are doing. Um, they harvest all the seeds out, they put them on some banana leaves, and then they cover the banana leaves because heat is a really central component to fermentation. So that's what's happening here. Um, this is an example of a uh, box fermentation. So you have these cascading boxes and those slats on the side that's facing the camera, those can come out. Um, and once the first stage is complete, you open the slat and then um, the beans sort of fall in on themselves and aerate a bit. And then they sit again, they're covered with uh, banana leaves. This is sort of a mid-fermentation mid process shot. So you can get the sense of the color change. Um, so again, that pulp is starting to sort of um, um, inf get infused in the seeds. And so it's a, it's, a, it's a, I never remember exactly what it is, but it's the transition of uh, some sort of lactic acid. I've, I've been told this God knows how many times and I always forget. So um, just know that there's some sort of uh, transition with, with uh, acids that are happening there and sugars. Uh, very important. And then once it is fermented and um, it's ready to go, a lot of farmers can actually just stick their hand in the fermentation box and, and get the sense of whether it's done um, based on the heat that they're uh, sensing through their hand. So that's how a lot of um, these farmers who have been doing this for multiple generations can, can know when their cocoa is ready to get dried. Um, so the next stage prior to our receiving it here at Kit hard is the drying stage. So you can see this is from Ivory Coast. Um, these are farmers who have, uh, they're very proud of their crop um, and they have put their freshly fermented uh, co cocoa on some raised drying beds. And this is the ideal way of drying cocoa, um, not on the ground, which you sometimes see in photographs. Um, it's really important to raise it off the ground so that it doesn't get any uh, flavors from, from the soil or the ground or any tarps that it's being on um, dried on. Uh, this is a photograph from Ecuador, again, just to give a sense of the differences in processing. Here you can see the gentleman, um, he's in sort of a greenhouse type structure, and that roof can um, go back and forth over, it's on little rollers, and so if, it rain, if it's raining, he can pull the roof over the cacao um, to prevent it from getting uh, moist, which you don't want to have happen. Um, you want to try and, the whole process of the drying, um, or the whole point of the drying process is to minimize the moisture level. So um, you want to try and get it at just the right level. And if it rains on your crop, um, that's not a good thing. So having, having a way to either pull the cocoa in and prevent it from getting wet um, is really important in this, in this case, he's got um, sort of a retractable roof. Um, and then once it's dried and ready to go, it gets bagged um, and placed in burlap sacks that then come to Guitard. Um, this is an example of a cut test. So um, here at Guitard, we have a QC lab. We also have a micro lab um, where they're constantly testing all of our products. I think um, by the time a product leaves Guitard, it's been tested about 75 times or so. Um, and this is an example of a of a cut test um, that we oftentimes do at Origin, but we do with every lot that we receive here at Guitard. So we basically take the seeds and put them in, um, looks like a little little slat that opens up like a book. You put the seeds in, you close it, and then you take a big knife and slice them in half. Um, and so we call it a guillotine. 
which is a strange word um, to use in this <laughs> like in this capacity, but it looks like one. Um, and it slices the beans in half, and you can tell a tremendous amount from a cut test. You can tell um, whether it's been properly fermented, which um, can be indicated uh, by the color. Um, you can tell if it's been properly dried by the presence of mold. Um, the fissures also tell a good fermentation. Um, if you remember that the, the cross section of the white bean that hadn't been fermented yet in an earlier slide, you saw some of those fissures. Uh, once it's dried and fermented properly, those fissures become a little bit more prominent. You want to have a lot of fissures. Um, this, this is a really good cut test. I should have put a photo in here of a bad one so you, so you guys could see that. Um, but this is a really crucial uh, stage to make sure that all of the lots that we're receiving here at Guitard um, meet our quality standard. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Tim. I put my mask back on, uh, and he's going to take everyone through the um, the, the production process. So be mindful of time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so just a quick note, you know. So before I came to Guitar, I spent almost 15 years making wine, running a winery in Italy. Uh, there, I would be surrounded by people um, who've been doing it. They're like the seventh generation person who has the pressure not to screw it up. And this was me and my family from Ohio. But anyway, uh, but it, it, there's, there, there's a lot of similarities between chocolate and wine. Um, but it also makes me think about, you know, when Amy's talking about, you know, showing some of those older slides and the old packaging and the old building. Um, it just reminds me of, it just resonates because it reminds me of two things. One is uh, it's very cool and it has great value frankly, to be involved in something where, you know, you're passing it to generation to generation. I just think that's, it's kind of a rare thing in this world and it's not unimportant, uh, I think at least us. Um, and it's also, uh, it's super, it, it's, it's awesome and great to be proud of what you make. You know, we make uh, great chocolate here and uh, it's just, it, it's, uh, it, it's something also that adds a lot of value. So, and, you know, talking about wine and chocolate, you know, I think most people would think, yeah, making wine's pretty hard, it's pretty complicated. You know, making chocolate, yeah, you know, throw some stuff together and there's chocolate. Uh, the reality is that for me personally, I think making chocolate, making wine is hard. You know, making good wine is hard. Um, it's harder to make chocolate and to make good chocolate. Um, it's just as complicated from a mechanical point of view. It's incredibly complicated from a process point of view because everything happening much more quickly with wine, you have some time. Um, and chemically, uh, you know, what's happening with the grape, Amy's talking about fermentation, you know, not only is there fermentation with uh, the cocoa beans, but what's happening inside of, uh, of the chocolate um, when we go to deposit it chemically is also super important so that the chocolate will behave, uh, well, most importantly, as our customers want it to behave. So anyway, with that, I'm going to try to take a quick tour. Again, I, we haven't, I haven't really done this before, just through the process. I've done a, some the tours, and uh, that's more fun. But anyway, um, when the beans come into guitar, the first step is that we, we roast them. Um, actually, I take that back. The first step is we got to clean them, which is actually a very important process, because uh, it, through the fermentation and the, the, whole, the whole process at origin, um, Sometimes we don't always get just cocoa beans. We found nails and bullet shells and all kinds of crazy, funky things. So, the, but anyway, the, the, the beans have to be cleaned. So they go through that process. Um, you know, when we're, making, when we're making chocolate, it all starts with the beans. And how you make chocolate is based upon blend. So if we're doing a single origin, we'll dump and clean single origins. Um, for some of our other chocolates, it's a highly confidential and very secret bean blend. Um, so we will dump those blends from different origins into our uh, into the into the, the a dump station, and it'll take it through a big cleaning process. Um, and from there, it'll get roasted. And roasting is, and again, here we have some similarities. It's kind of you kind of get into almost like the aging process. But how you roast, you know, there's a couple very important things in the roasting process. It's the type of roaster. In fact, for those who have been on our tours. We don't really let people take pictures of certain parts of the plant and the roasters, you know, it's great. You can come look at it, but the roasters are something we don't let people take pictures of because the, the, the way in which you roast, there's many different ways in which you roast. Um, and it's not just the type of roaster and how you roast, but it's time and temperature of roast is also very important. So each bean blend that we make to make what I'll refer to as chocolate liquor, which I'll explain in a little bit, uh, has a recipe. And it's not just what percentage of beans from which origin goes into that, but it's the time and 
and temperature and the, the, the type of roaster we will put it through um, that our roaster operators have to have to follow. Uh, just to note on the operators, you know, and again, like wine, you know, the making chocolate like wine is, it's really a blend of art and science. Um, you know, we, we have, uh, in fact, right about this time in a couple of weeks, you know, I think one of the things that Gary Guitar, Amy's dad, uh, takes great pleasure in, we, we give out um, every five years at Christmas time, we honor those people who have been, who've been at Guitar on their fifth year, 10th year, 15th year, 20th year, you know, and this year, like every year, you know, we'll be handing out like a service award to somebody who's been here 40 years, somebody who's been here 35 years. You know, to become an operator in some of our work areas, like in our roasting area, it takes about a year. Of, uh, of training. Um, so it's not just you kind of bring people in, you push some buttons and you follow a formula. It's just, it's just so much more complicated than that. So um, anyway, moving on from roasting, just push. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so once it's roasted, you know, you've got a roasted cocoa bean that has gone through a kill step. Uh, so now that's kind of what we refer to as the dirty area of the plant, and, but now it's gone through the roasting, so now it's clean, the, the, you know, any bacteria, bacteria has, been, has been killed off. But we've got to, we now we've got to break up the bean. We have a roasted bean that now has to be broken up. So it goes through a machine we call a winnower, a breaker, and it slams the bean against these roasted beans against, the, against breakers to break them up into a size, as Amy said, we're a grinding operation that then can be ground. So, and this is an example of some, uh, what we call nibs, some broken up beans that have gone through the winnowing step uh, that we can then grind. So if I just go through here, so re yeah, remind me when yeah. we come to like a video. Yeah, um, we're good. Okay, so right here we have uh, chocolate liquor. This is not alcoholic. Um, something I didn't know when I first heard about chocolate liquor. I was like, huh, that sounds interesting. How do we make that? <laughs> so, I I had to learn. Um, the other cool thing, by the way, about making chocolate is I've been here four and a half years and I, like every day I still learn stuff, uh, which is fun. Um, but so now it goes through, and again, it's another kind of area where we don't let people take pictures. It's highly confidential. There's a number, how you go about grinding it into, this is just pure ground up. If you tasted it, it'd be, they all have different flavors based upon the beans and or, and or the bean blend. But it's not just the bean blend and how it was roasted. Now, now it's what type of grinding machine it went through. We have a number of different grinding machines. Um, some are stone, some are, some are using a different grinding mechanism. Um, you know, the, 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 the temperature, the fineness, the type of grind that it goes through and the various machines, the path that it will travel through our liquor mill area. Where we have a number of different types of grinding machine to end up with a liquor that again, is really all about flavor. Um, and we're not just about flavor, but also about the grind, the mouthfeel. Uh, if you have a coarse grind liquor um, and plus some of the other ingredients, you know, you feel that in your mouth. If you have kind of a cheaper chocolate, you know, you can taste maybe a little bit of grittiness, which is fine. You know, for really fine chocolate, you have that, uh, which you'll taste in a bit. You'll have that mo much more fine mouthfeel. And a big part of that is really through the, the grinding and the refining process. So now we have chocolate liquor. Um, which is, that's all it is. It's just ground up cocoa beans uh, that have gone through a grinding process. How do I, oops, do I go. just do that? Yeah. Okay, so uh, now we gotta start making chocolate. So uh, it, it goes through, the next step is uh, that liquor goes into a big holding tank, you know, it can be about uh, 50,000 pounds of that in, uh, in one tank. Um, and we have a lot of tanks in our, in our facility. <laughs> uh, we gotta keep it at about, a, the, the liquor gets very hot. Um, so uh, it's, it can come into this refining area at about 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, but as I said, now we gotta start making chocolate. So we gotta start putting the other stuff in there. So we, we blend in a mixer, we'll pull in liquor from a tank, we'll put in sugar according to a formula, uh, and uh, like a cocoa butter, depending on what we're making. Um, you know, co uh, milk powder if we're making milk chocolate. Obviously we're making it dark, it won't have milk chocolate in there. Um, and uh, maybe some other ingredients, but there we got to mix it. So it goes into a big, uh, like about a 5,000 pound, we call it mixer. It's a big metal uh, little tank and it's all mixed together for a little while. But now you've just got a big kind of clay-like log mass uh, and you got to do something with it. So we put it through, this is a picture of our five roll refiner. We have a number of these uh, in our refining area. 
So it'll, it'll come, the, 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 the clay-like mass will come in and on this bottom roll right down here, you can't see my hand. <laughs> so <laughs> that bottom roll is, uh, it'll get fed down in there and it'll go through this grind, another grinding process where everything was mixed together and it'll go through these rolls up and down like this and get sheared. It's kind of a shearing motion and it'll come out that top roll, that fifth roll, so on the bottom is the first roll. Um, these rolls are heated and, and this is where the degree of fineness you want, you'll set the gap between the rolls. So if you want it super fine, it'll be much more, much smaller gap between the rolls. And yep, and that's what will happen. You'll come out with what we call a chocolate flake at the other end. And this is a little video of the flake coming out of the backside of that refiner. Is that it for the video? Yeah, let's see, <laughs> let's see if I can. Um, sorry, everyone. There we go. Oh, okay. Yeah, so then it'll get conveyed that, uh, so now you've got something that sort of tastes like chocolate a little bit. It's flake. It's actually really, really tasty. Um, but it, it starts tasting like chocolate. The next step is to go into what we call a conch, which will be a, a, a much bigger tank with agitation inside. And that flake will get mixed with uh, some more cocoa butter um, and maybe some lecithin. Uh, and now we got to make it. So it'll, it'll, there'll be, a, again, another recipe for this. So now, you know, this is kind of like another, the, the refining area has a recipe of what we put in. The, now it goes into the conch. And again, this is now kind of what I would, if you've been to a winery, this is almost like the, the barrel room of a winery where, you know, this is where you really develop flavor. You know, you've developed flavor the, throughout this whole process and flavor is so important to us. But in the conching process, again, it's all about the type of conch, another area where, you know, I get very like rigid. You can't take picture here. You can't take picture here. You can't take picture in our conch room either. Sorry. Um, you, you know, you can look at it, but uh, because the type of conch, uh, the time and temperature of the conch, the type of agitation inside that conch, as you saw in that video, that huge moving arms in there, like that all makes a difference. And so it becomes very, very difficult to reverse engineer chocolate. I mean, I think a lot of our competition would love to, to, to steal some of our customers, but it's very difficult to reverse engineer the chocolate, you know, um, because there's so many steps. And all this is happening within a period of a couple of days. You know, it's, it, so when I was saying it's different than wine, it's more complicated than wine. You know, everything flows from one to one to one to one to one. Uh, and this all happens within a couple of days. But out of the, once it's finished with the conching process and it's now a, a, a hot liquid chocolate, you know, maybe around 160 degrees. So we, we're trying to cool it down a little bit and it'll go to a holding tank. So from the holding tank, now we're ready to deposit, which is to make the chips or wafers or bars, or whatever we're gonna do. Now we've really got chocolate, but for the chocolate to behave as we want it to behave, and or more importantly, as we want our customers, uh, for if they're gonna do something with our chocolate and they want it to, to do what it's supposed to do and to look how it's supposed to look, to hold its shape like it's supposed to hold its shape. Uh, it's for chocolate. It's got to go through what we call a, a tempering machine, and where it'll it'll break down the tempering machine will break down the crystals within the chocolate, and recreate the right kind of crystals inside the chocolate. Uh, we only have an hour. I mean, we could spend hours just on the chemical chemistry of this. Yeah, it's almost like if you have a um, chocolate bar that's in your car and it uh, melts a little bit and you pick it up and it's not totally melted, but it has some white on it. Some people might think that it's got mold. Um, that's where your your car and the heat in the car is basically um, broken the temper. And so the crystal structure that you, the ideal crystal structure, which is a beta five crystal form uh, for any anyone who wants to know, um, that's basically broken and it's reformed in an inopportune way. You can always retemper it, um, but what our job is, is what Tim was saying, is sort of to create the tempering um, it process uh, so that when we deposit it, it then, you know, solidifies in a, in a proper way. It holds way. its shape, it snaps when you make it, it has the right mouthfeel, it doesn't, it doesn't bloom. You know, again, our customers, it'll, it'll, the chocolate will perform as they want it to, to perform. Um, you know, and at this point we do, you know, we talk about, Amy talked about the 70 checks, you know, like we, we take temper checks of our, of our chocolate every two hours on the lines. You know, we have a number of different depositing lines. Uh, this is a picture of our, our Greer, our Greer depositor, which does 10 pound bars. So we get a lot of customers who want those 10 pound bars for shaving. They want it for melting down, um, you know, for a lots of different uses. Um, a lot of people just like to buy a big old bar of chocolate. Uh, we don't sell that one at retail, by the way. 
Um, and then our other lines, you know, we will do the, the chips, the wafers, um, or then some of our own bars. Bars, powders, yeah. Yeah. So, um, boy, I kind of ran through that pretty quickly, but I think, uh, <laughs> anyway, we got time for questions at the end, so. Yeah. Um, so I guess I'll move into the, the tasting portion. I'm going to take my mask off. Oh, yeah. um, so again, I, I'm conscious of time and we'll have, uh, we'll have a chance to answer some questions at the end. Both of us, there's a lot to go over in um, a little bit less than an hour. So we, we, we realized we zipped through a fair amount of that. So um, we'll be able to answer some, some questions. But um, just to give sort of a big overview of how to taste chocolate, um, what we've done here is we've sort of outlined a five-step approach to um, the process of, of tasting chocolate. We're not going to go through each of these um, per se as we talk through these, but just to give you a um, an overview of what you're going to want to do when we launch into these. So the first thing is to look at them. So if you have, which sounds funny, but if you've got a piece of white paper near you, um, that's what, what we typically use around here to look at the color. Um, but you're going to want to look at um, the color of the chocolate. And that tells a lot uh, about it. A lot of people just think, oh, chocolate's brown. Uh, but there's also really distinct nuances in chocolate. Um, we have an Ecuador single origin, which you don't have in your tasting kits. Um, but that tends to be really, really dark. Tim was mentioning um, the when, when you grind the nibs into liquor, um, you have unsweetened chocolate. Um, Ecuador tends to have a little bit of less fat in it. It's a harder bean than um, some of the other beans. Whether that contributes to the color difference, I'm not entirely sure. But um, all that is to say is that different origins are totally different and color is a really um, specific uh, and, and tangible thing to pick up. Um, then you want to listen, and that's easiest done um, when you're dealing with a bar of chocolate. Doing it with the wafers are going to be a little bit more difficult, um, but just to show you what you're going to do when you go into your tasting, um, you can just snap the wafer and a good snap is an indication of a really great temper. So Tim was just talking about the importance of tempering. Um, tempering is oftentimes a really even um, sort of uh, break. Um, so when you break it, not only listening for a snap, but also a clean cut, um, that's a really good indication for a good temper. And um, then you wanna smell it. And again, Tim, Tim was making quite a few parallels to wine. This is not dissimilar to that. Um, and so you're gonna wanna smell it and take note of any aromas that you're picking up. And as you get to the tasting piece, you're gonna to wanna to try and compare what you're smelling to your tasting. Um, we all know that there's oftentimes overlap between um, what you're tasting is actually what you're smelling. Um, but if you can, try and separate the two and start to see where there's overlap and where there might be differences. Um, and then you wanna breathe. So as you're eating it, um, I tend to try and explain that you wanna sort of uh, very similar to wine for those of you who are familiar, um, you wanna kind of throw the smell that you're, or the um, sort of the, the smell, I guess, back through towards the back of your throat. And if you can try and get a little bit of it into your nasal cavity, as weird again as that sounds. I'm sorry, we have a flickering light. <laughs> we forgot to mention that we are in a little bit of a time warp here as at Guitar. Yeah. We're, we are a fully functioning factory. So um, we're, yeah, it's like 1973 here. But um, anyway, so uh, look, listen, smell, eat, and breathe um, are sort of the key things that you want to keep in mind as you're tasting. Um, so the first piece that we're going to go through are the two single origins that you received. Um, I got a phone call from one of the participants today asking um, how much chocolate is in the bags that you received. Each bag contains one pound of chocolate. So um, we're certainly not tasting a pound of chocolate this evening, um, but you also should have received some recipes in your um, tasting kits. And that's intended to um, really take advantage of the tastings that we're going to experience tonight and encourage you to experience. Uh, explore pairings, flavor pairings, maybe make a chocolate chip cookie with some of these and compare the chocolate chip cookie um, made with your Madagascar um, versus your Peru and really sort of explore the possibilities um, that we're gonna uncover today. So just to give you a landscape of what we have, we have four single origins here um, that we just recently launched. Uh, we were one of the first companies to introduce single origins in the US. And um, so we are very proud of them. We recently reformulated them to have different percentages. So um, these all are formulated to heighten and bring to life the um, origins that we believe it's sort of intended to be the best uh, articulation of the beans. So we're tasting a Madagascar 
Ecuador and a Peru. Um, the Granada and the Ecuador are not included in your kit. So just want um, to explicitly mention that so people don't get confused. Um, so the first one we're going to taste is a Madagascar. Um, just a little bit about this one. Um, this is from Akasin uh, Estate in the Sombriano Valley of Madagascar, which is sort of the northwest region. Um, this is from a farm um, from a gentleman, Bertil Akasin, and he's a longtime family friend of ours. His dad um, had a farm as well, and so we're sourcing this uh, organic cacao from him. Um, and so just there's some information there if you um, want to read it at your leisure. Um, but it's also really important to keep in mind that these are all sourced from really particular farms. So, um, and if you can remember some of the stuff that we were talking about earlier, the, the importance of proper cultivation and fermentation and drying um, is really important, particularly when it comes to single origins, because it's all, all you have going um, in this origin. So we're gonna taste alongside you guys. We've got smaller jars here. So again, don't get confused. Um, so again, take your, take your, um, your chocolate, take a look at the color. Uh, Madagascar tends to be a much uh, lighter, redder hue than um, something else. You could probably compare it to the Peru, not to get of our, ahead of ourselves, but if you just wanna compare the color to it, um, it's gonna look a little bit more red than the Peru. Um, again, take a look at the color. You're gonna want to snap it. Hopefully it has a good temper. It didn't get uh, yeah. uh, damaged in, in shipping. Um, you wanna smell it and take note of any smells. Again, just to remind everyone, um, normally uh, in a little bit of a smaller group, I'd, I'd love to see what everyone's tasting um, and encourage folks to do that. But um, rather than talking out loud, since we're all muted, uh, please share your comments in the chat because I think it's really fun to encourage people to express what they're, what they're tasting. Much like color um, and perception of color, we all um, perceive things differently just like everything in life. Um, so if you feel so inclined to sort of share what you're tasting and what you're smelling, please do. Um, Cause I think it also inspires other people um, to think about it. We have two chefs on staff here at Guitard, um, Donald Russell and Josh Johnson, and they are um, extremely talented. They have um, worked outside of uh, guitar for many years prior to coming to us, uh, competed on the world stage. Um, and there are, yes, indeed, there are world competitions around pastry, um, but they do a lot of work with our single origins that are pairing chocolate um, and pairing the single origins with things. So they'll oftentimes taste this and start trying to create associations with what they're tasting. So they might taste this Madagascar and start tasting some savory spices. Uh, they might pick up on some, um, tart citrus. Whenever I taste this, I pick up on some like yuzu, some really bright citrus notes. Um, I also get a lot of cranberry notes. Um, when you think about flavor and flavor pairings and just really flavor bright citrus here. in general, you know, there's like fruit. Okay. Well, what kind of fruit? There's berry. Well, is it fresh berry or is it dried berry? Is it strawberry or is it more of a cranberry? Is it tart or is it fresh? Is it juicy? Is it you know, is it more um, granular? Is it more like a blueberry? Like there's so many different layers that you can start to challenge yourself to think about. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's sort of trying to um, deconstruct the flavors and the flavor associations that our brains make with things that we consume on an everyday and trying to apply them in a different context is a really interesting exercise. Um, you know, it's like, uh, cotton candy. Like I was tasting chocolate the other day and I was like, oh, it's cotton candy. And everyone around the table was like, yeah, it does taste like cotton candy, but it's forcing yourself to make those associations, which um, is not an easy thing to do. I think it, it, uh, it requires a lot of practice. So um, I'm not able to see the chat, but I do see a little thing popping down on my screen, <laughs> which makes me think that people are, are adding their contributions in there. Um, I want to encourage everyone to, to really embrace the fact that there are no wrong answers here. Um, so uh, again, just trying to challenge yourself to see what, what you're tasting. I mean, I think the other important thing for tasting is not just for pairing and what you get out of it, but it's, it's always kind of like a connective thing, mm -hmm. you know, like it, it might, might make you, remind you of something, Yeah. you know, like you smell that, oh man, that reminds me of, when I, of that, or when you yeah. taste something, it's, you know, that's one of the cool things about this. It's, it's just, a, it's a connective thing with you. It stirs a memory. Right. Sometimes. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so moving on to the Peru, 
Um, again, I'm mindful of time here, so we might zip through this a little bit quicker than um, we intended. Um, so this is a 66. This comes from Oro Verde um, Cooperative in um, San Martin, Peru. Again, looking at the color um, against the Madagascar, it's going to be a little bit darker, not as red. Um, and this is also made with organic cacao. So it's not an organic product because it's not made with organic sugar, um, but it is made with organic um, cacao. Uh, so again, do the same thing, snap it, um, listen to the snap, smell it, try and take note of what you're smelling. A lot of times what you're smelling, there'll be some alignment with what you're gonna taste and then move into the tasting, which um, again, very different from the Madagascar. Um, it still has some bright fruitiness to it, but it's a very different fruit. Um, it's kind of peachy, um, a little bit like melony, um, but there's a lot of red fruit there. Um, unripe mango we have listed there as a flavor note. Um, and then there's a lot of lingering floral notes as well, um, which is a really um, uh, particular flavor note for Peru. So again, you can start to create uh, an appreciation for the differences in flavor notes that are coming from two products with uh, relatively similar formulations. So it's not like you've got an, an exceedingly larger amount of sugar in one or the other. Um, but, you know, they're very, very different flavor notes. And you can start to think as you're working with it or baking with it at home, or if you can put on your pastry chef hat and start thinking about, oh, if you're designing a bonbon, um, what do you want to put with this product that would really elevate the delivery of the chocolate? Um, in the case of the Madagascar, pastry chefs uh, paired it with cassis. Um, and so that was like, a, it just elevated and escalated the delivery of that Madagascar. And so you can really start to create this whole sort of multi-dimensional uh, um, sort of uh, expression of flavor um, simply by just exploring stuff. They'll oftentimes just take a bite of it, um, of a chocolate and take a bite of banana or take a bite of chocolate and take a bite of jam and try and start to create these flavor associations. Um, and I'd encourage all of you to do that um, at home uh, with your families and then use that to inform some of your um, adventures uh, baking. Um, now we're going to move on to the, the chocolate bar. So this is a really special chocolate bar. Um, we created it in celebration of our 150th anniversary, which we celebrated um, a few years ago. These bars are not that old. <laughs> um, but we celebrate our 150th um, anniversary. And this is a, an old advertisement. By now you're all aware of my affinity for old advertisements. But um, this is an old advertisement that shows where we sourced our beans from back um, before there was a real global of the U.S. like a Hershey, um, or even if you were in Europe, you were, you were able to get beans from the Caribbean, from Africa. Um, and as we talked about early on, South American beans, um, beans that are grown in Indonesia, in, in that region of the world versus West Africa, they're very different flavor profiles. West African cocoa tends to have like a really rich, deep sort of chocolate flavor to it um, versus Ecuador um, or South America for that matter, tends to have um, a little bit more floral or fruity notes to them just inherently based on their genetics. So as you can imagine, companies that were processing cocoa that were based on the West Coast, they're sort of developed this East Coast, West Coast flavor phenomenon, um, just based primarily on where you were getting your beans from. So what we did was we created the blend of what one would have purchased um, back in the founding of our company. So we sourced sort of the modern day versions of beans that we would have had then. So this particular bar contains Ecuador, um, which is uh, a direct reflection of what we were sourcing then. Java, which again is a direct reflection. Um, to represent Samoa, we sourced Hawaii. Um, we work really closely with the Dole Plantation um, on Oahu currently. Um, and so we sourced beans for them, from them for this uh, particular bar. And then um, Ecuador Java, and Brazil. How could I forget Brazil? So Brazil, Ecuador, Java, and Hawaiian. Um, so again, as you taste this and go through a similar process, you can, you're sort of taking a step back in time and, um, 
and, and experiencing a flavor that would have been what you would have tasted back um, when the company was first founded, uh, more or less. Um, so yes, yeah, so you get a really unique and complex um, expression. Again, this is also with the intention of giving everyone an appreciation for blends. A lot of times single origins get um, a fair amount of uh, the, the sort of uh, clout of being a fine, fine product, but um, you can make a really amazing blend as well. Um, and that's really important to keep in mind. So um, again, multi bean blend, um, and you've got a, a fair amount of acidity um, that's coming along with some fresh fruit um, that's paired really, really nicely with a little bit of pineapple. Um, and then again, you get some citrus and then it's all sort of encompassed in a really deep um, sense, uh, sort of end note of chocolate, um, which is not actually written there, but um, you get it. So um, that was a. That we do. Yeah, wow. we did okay. <laughs> 555. Yeah. Wow. Um, oh, I, I failed to mention this is a 62%. So um, it's a little bit lighter, lighter than the others. Um, so yeah. There we go. All right. How do we. Uh... I don't know. <laughs> do we stop sharing? I'm not sure. I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. I think that's it. That was so great. That was so fun. Thank you so much, Tim and Amy. I'm curious. We're at um, about five to six and I'm available to stay for a little longer. Do you guys, are, do you need to wrap up at six? Because we do have a bunch of questions, but we want to respect your time. So what, what works for you guys? If we're oh, muted. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Zoom 101. Um, we can stay for a little bit. <laughs> okay, great. Um, let's see here. That one eat more chocolate. Uh, <laughs> hold on one sec. Okay. Um, I think we might be able to see the um, Q and A as well if you want our. Yeah, I don't. Oh, I think it's because I might be the host. I mean, that's why. Or maybe not. Um, okay, here. So you might have already answered this, but many of the flavors described are fruity. Is this just a common trait with chocolate because of the type of plant it is, or is it really more related to the processing? Um, it's really the genetics. Um, so different varietals have different inherent flavor notes to them. So um, as I mentioned, like Ghana, Ivory Coast, those tend to, sorry, I'll try and pull this off. Um, <laughs> Those oh, wow. it's very odd. Um, those tend to uh, be a little bit less fruity, I guess you could say. Um, I understand the the correlation between cocoa being a fruit um, and the concept of it being. Um, than being fruity, but at the same time, if you think about all of the different processes that it goes through from the fermentation, which is developing flavor to the drying, which also develops flavor. And then as Tim walked through the roasting, um, all of those steps are flavor developers. So um, by the time you end up with the end product, it really has less to do with the fact that it is a fruit um, and that it starts off as a fruit and more about the inherent flavor notes um, of, the, of the cacao itself. But I think one of the other things is the, uh, I mean, certainly there are other flavor notes you can get from other beans you know you can get like a whiny i mean there's yeah uh, there, there's other things but you know again like wine i shouldn't probably talk as much about wine but the growing season can also affect the the the, the cocoa beans and so trying to achieve consistency is such a big part of our test, testing to achieve that that flavor profile because you know you want your the to give to your customers that taste that they're expecting that they're trusting you're going to deliver to them so it's kind of a big part of the challenge yeah um, so much interesting stuff and so many great questions. Um, I, so someone had a question which I would love to know the answer to, which is, um, can you recommend, do you have any like off the quick recommendations for like wine or cocktails <laughs> to pair <laughs> with these delicious chocolates? Well, okay, me personally, like I've done the wine and chocolate tastings. Like, I, I'm actually not a huge fan of wine chocolate together, but yeah. for me, it's just wines with a high residual sugar content. 
Um, so again, I made wine in Italy. Most wine in Italy is more dry, acidic, yeah. and uh, you know there are certainly some wines with a higher residual sugar content, like a, a an Amarone or something like that in the states, like a Zinfandel. Um, you know, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> or, <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, we talk about it often. I think my dad is not a huge fan um, of it either. I think yeah, it, I think some people I've actually heard they do um, beer and uh, and chocolate tastings. Like that's an interesting um, adventure as well. But I do know a fair amount of people who also really yeah. enjoy doing wine and chocolate. So um, well, I think I, sort of in the spirit of pairing and discovery, um, I would encourage everyone to sort of get an array of wines and to <laughs> do a... Uh, yeah, it, a little exploration. It's kind of whatever you like. I mean, we, some of the tastings that I've done with chocolate have been more like chocolate in stuff, like a chicken mole. Yeah. You know, that has like a, you, you get a good chocolate taste. You know, the chocolate yeah. is a key component of that with a wine. Um, but yeah, I know a lot of people that love the, the wine and chocolate. And, yeah. You know, <laughs> they're not wrong. <laughs> um, this is an interesting one. I've read that there is a cacao shortage. Is that true? And how are you dealing with that shortage, if so? Um, so cacao is an agricultural product. So like many things, it sort of ebbs and flows with um, uh, El Nino, La Nina. Um, I, I always shy away from making clear cut statements about there being a cacao shortage. I, um, I wouldn't go as far as to say that there is a shortage. Um, I think that that has been a topic of conversation for many years at this point. Um, and I think principles of economics will always dictate sort of the shortages aside from uh, agricultural implications of things. So, um, you know, I think if, if there is a, um, obviously if, if there's a, a statement that there's a shortage, then um, there will be market implications to that as well. So I think there's, there's lots of dynamics that um, are at play when those topics come up, come about. But um, I mean, we, as I talked about, we are constantly traveling to origin and um, meeting with farmers and trying to encourage um, flavor as a, as a element for them to focus on in addition to disease resistance and high productivity. So um, we always want, farmers to have <laughs> the rest of the light. Um, we always want uh, farmers to have as much cocoa as they as they can um, sell but we also want to make sure that there's um, you know that it that it tastes good and that they can get a premium for that yeah and I, I feel and I know Amy feels super strongly you know sustainability is not a marketing a marketing term you know it's something and not it's not just guitar you know I think the industry in general is understanding the importance of you know, not just organic but of, of that word sustainable um, it's again, it, I can't say it strongly enough. It's just not a marketing term. Yeah. Yeah. Um, could you guys share how to properly use the terms cocoa versus cacao and describe what the differences are between cocoa, cocoa powder, cacao powder, and Dutch process cocoa yeah. powder? <laughs> um, I realized because I was in the middle of the presentation, I had like a meta moment where I realized that I was interchanging the terms, which happens all the time. Um, like, I guess in most basic levels, cacao is referred to anything that's grown at origin. Once it comes to guitar and gets roasted, or when the bean, the raw beans sort of like processed from origin, it's considered cocoa. So that's roughly how we refer to it here. Um, in terms of making cocoa powder, um, you take the roasted beans uh, that Tim talked through, you grind them into liquor. Um, I did see a question, so I'm gonna try and answer two questions in one. Um, the nibs are more or less 50% fat, 50% solid. So much like when you make peanut, grind peanuts to make peanut butter, when you grind nibs, just because of the inherent fat content of those nibs, um, you're gonna, it's gonna liquefy more, I mean, liquefy might be a little bit of an over, overstatement, but that's how it gets really liquidy because it's much like when you make peanut butter, it's just grinding up and everything just gets loose. Um, so if you're making cocoa powder, that unsweetened um, chocolate or the ground nibs get put sort of a different workflow. So if you're making chocolate, that liquor goes into um, mixing and refining, and then you get that flake. If you're making cocoa powder, it goes from the unsweetened chocolate into a hydraulic press um, and the liquor gets pressed with 
I don't even know how much pressure. Um, huge and amount of force. Huge amount of force, and you basically separate your solids from your butter. So you'll have um, a like butter, liquid butter that's coming out of the press and going into a tank, which um, we didn't even get into this, but when you think about cacao percentages, I'm answering another question here. Um, when you think of cacao percentages, uh, more or less, if you go back to that 50-50 split, um, the, the uh, no, how can I simplify, um, now I'm gonna go down a rabbit hole. Um, when you look at a percentage like a 62%, the remaining percentage, the, what is it, 48% here is sugar. Um, but if you deconstruct the 62%, it's more or less 50-50 from the nibs, but it will also have added cocoa butter. So I bring this up because not every percentage is created equal. So if you see a 70% on shelf or more, more um, impactful would be, you might see a 100% on shelf, but it might be 85% um, solid. So 50-50 and with 15% um, added cocoa butter. So it's gonna not taste like if you just had straight up ground nibs, like it's going to taste much, much weaker. We have a 91% that has a fair amount of added cocoa butter to it. And you can tell like it's not doesn't taste like a 91 is beautiful. And I love it. But we've added that cocoa butter back in. So I know there's a question, what do you do with the cocoa butter, you oftentimes add it back in a lot of pastry chefs um, need product that is um, really viscous. And that's when you've added cocoa butter back in and the flow properties are totally different. Like a wafer um, has more added cocoa butter in it than a chocolate chip, um, which is why when you bake a chocolate chip cookie with chocolate chips, your cookie stands up higher than if you bake a chocolate chip cookie with wafers, because your wafers are flatter and your cookie is going to be flatter and it's going to be more like buttery, I guess. Um, I'm answering, like trying to answer a bunch of questions in one answer. But um, in other words, uh, the nibs are 50-50. Uh, your percentages are deconstructed to have additional cocoa butter in them, which affects performance for pastry chef. Um, and you make cocoa powder through a hydraulic press. Yeah. Uh, this is important <laughs> to know there's a legal definition of what is chocolate. Right. The type of fat you can put in the chocolate, which in this case yeah. is cocoa butter. That's you a really know, so good that point. precludes you from you know, putting in cheaper substitutes that dumb down the product. Actually, I'm going to add to that. Now we're getting another <laughs> rabbit hole. Um, years ago, there was an effort to try to um, change the standards of identity for chocolate that would allow manufacturers to use different types of um, fats in chocolate. And uh, my dad actually, before like <laughs> social media and everything. He started a blog um, called Don't Mess With Our Chocolate. Um, and he had a whole movement. He wrote letters to the FDA. He, I think he testified, uh, there was like a whole big thing. Um, and he basically won the war against um, including uh, alternative fats. And in Europe, I believe um, they, you don't have to, you can call something chocolate if you have alternative fats in it. And um, that's why in the States, if you see chocolate flavored on on packaging, it's oftentimes uh, turn the package over and look in the ingredient statement because it will oftentimes um, have an alternative fat in it that that again doesn't allow someone to just call it chocolate. Yeah. So anyway, I remember when he did that. I remember telling him this before I came here. Yeah, I remember telling him, man, I admire what you're doing. You're gonna lose. Oh yeah. <laughs> and I was so glad I was wrong. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty great. Oops. Oops. We... No, she's being. No. Sorry. Um. We'll have, I think we'll have this be the last question in the interest of your time and letting everyone move on with their evening, but curious, um, do you guys have personal favorite origins or blends at Guitard? Um, well, I was eating our semi-sweet chips out of the bag today. <laughs> I love um, I oftentimes eat our milk chips. Um, milk chocolate actually also is uh, oftentimes overlooked. It is very difficult to make. Um, so I would encourage all of you to try and do your own little milk chocolate tastings to appreciate the complexity of them because um, there's, there's a lot to be appreciated there. Um, and between what we tasted today, um, I find this 62% really, really special. Um, because it's sort of the the whole is greater than the sum of the parts um, in in true form. So I don't know. Uh, you know, you. Uh, yeah. The, we, there's a um, is a bar we started to make. We haven't really released it in wide form yet. Uh, it's more of a milk chocolate bar. Oh. Um, it's got a very caramelly flavor, 
and it just it reminds me. I grew up in England. It reminds me of when I was a kid. Oh, you know, and I love it. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I was like, what's he talking about? Yep, yeah. yep. And it's just got this wonderful malty caramel type of flavor in the milk chocolate, and I, I've been known to steal some of those ten pound bars. Well, um, we there have been quite a few comments. Just I thought you guys would appreciate that. There, we've got lots of local families. Oh. watching tonight who are talking about how they love the fact that Burlingame and Hillsborough often smell like chocolate. Oh. So they, lots of thank yous to you for that. Um, but yeah, this has been so interesting and I am super hungry and going to go see if I can find some chocolate in my kitchen. Um, Cause I don't actually, I've, ended up out of town, so I don't have the chocolate here with me, which is a oh. bummer, but uh, we'll go see what I can round up because <laughs> I've got a craving to for sure. But thank you guys so much for sharing your time and knowledge and energy with us tonight. This was so fun. Well, thanks for having yeah, us. Yeah, you're and, very uh, welcome. You know, thanks everybody for joining. You know, for Amy and I, we get to talk about what we love doing, so it's all good for yeah. us. So thank you guys for joining. And for everyone else, thank you to all of you who attended tonight for joining us. If you have suggestions for other alumni or parent speakers or would like to be featured yourself in a future WashU event, please email the Alumni Association. It's alumniassociation at wistol.edu. Um, and we encourage everybody to check out the digital resources and uh, let's see, digital resources and virtual connection page on the alumni website to learn about other ways to connect with WashU alumni, parents, students, and faculty. That link will also be in the chat. Um, and that page is updated regularly, and it's a great way to see what's going on. Um, Thank you to everyone for attending tonight. Again, thank you so much, Tim and Amy, and we wish everyone a really wonderful holiday season with your families. Happy holidays. Stay Bye, safe. Everybody. Bye.